We are in Whistler, British Columbia for the Whistler Film Festival and to talk to this guy, Jason Priestley. How are you? I'm good, Ian. How are really, you? Good. Really nice to meet you. How do I describe you? Uh, actor, director, former race car driver. All right. Lots of reasons to talk to Jason, which we're going to do in a second. But first, uh, some of his career highlights. In the 1990s, Vancouver's Jason Priestley hung out in the coolest neighborhood on TV. But coming up with an encore did not come easy. Priestley raced cars, he continued to act, and built a career as a director. His current project, a documentary on one of hockey's most controversial characters, the former owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs, Harold Ballard, a Stanley Cup winner who also served time in penitentiary. We started by challenging Priestley, what does he remember about that famous zip code? Okay. 90210 trivia. Got to be quick on this. Okay. All right. You got to get them right and be fast. Okay. The name of the newspaper founded by Brandon Walsh and Steve Sanders. Whoa. Oh, my God. That was called the Beverly Beat? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well done. Yeah, you got it right. Whew. Okay, good. <laughs> Question two. Peach Pit was a real restaurant. What was the real restaurant called? That was called the Apple Pan. I have to check and see? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So one last question, your favorite directing moment on 90210? My favorite directing moment? Yeah. Wow. Okay, uh, Okay. my favorite directing moment uh, in Luke Perry's uh, last episode that he ever did, you know, Luke, you know, falling to his knees in the rain. So we had rain towers everywhere and Luke was falling to his knees, you know, looking up in the heavens and Crono, you know, and I had a, the camera on a crane pulling away from him in the rain and, yeah. you know, Luke and I were just, you know, having the best time shooting all that stuff. And, you know, I, uh, I, th I think back to those kind of moments now that he's gone. You must miss him a lot. It's been 22 years since 90210 yeah. went off the air. Does, does it yeah. still have an impact on your life? I think in some way it'll always have an impact on my life. I mean, that show was a global phenomenon, uh, you know, at a, at a time when when television shows were were still like appointment television. And mm -hmm. the shows nowadays, nowadays that are water cooler shows are very few and far between, but back then, um, you know, people people had viewing parties, and certainly, you know, there was a certain generation that it was very impactful in their lives, and I think it will it will always uh, it will always impact my life. I directed 15 episodes of that show by the time we were all said and done, and I produced 64 episodes, and I executive produced 64 episodes, and uh, you know, I, I I knew from a very early. Uh, stage that I, I I had an opportunity to go to the Aaron Spelling Film School and and I wanted to learn how to direct and produce and executive produce television from from the guy who was the most successful television producer in history and I wanted to take advantage of that situation and um, and so I did it's uh, been a, proved to be a very good choice on on my part. I was watching an interview you did with George Strombolopoulos probably about ten years ago and there's a there's a clip in it. When that show ended, I, I, I just sort of, I, 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 just, I didn't reset fast enough. So I was, so it was, it was, it was, it was a difficult time for me because of that. Tell me more about that. Well, uh, the run of Beverly Hills 90210 really took me from when I was 20 till I was 30 years old, and then the. The, the show, uh, or I, I mean, I left the show in the ninth season. The show went on for another year. But I, so I was 29 years old. And the entire run of my 20s, I was, you know, I was going 1,000 miles an hour and working constantly. As a young man, I, I set certain goals for myself. You know, I want to, you know, I want to, I want to be a, a working actor. I want to be a successful actor. I want to have fame and fortune and everything that goes with it, right? And and as I as I started attaining those goals and and all and I and I got to those places I wanted to get to, I'd always been like super motivated and always, you know, always really driven and always knew where you know where I was going and what I was doing and why I was doing it. And all of a sudden, I was like, like I, I didn't really have a reason to get out of bed, and I didn't really want to get out of bed. Wow. I was like, well, well, you know, 
Well, you know, like I was, I was just sort of sitting around and waiting for the phone to ring. You know, it was kind of like that. And did, did it ring? No. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, you know, and I and I and I, you know, and I think that sort of that I think that was kind of a problem for me too. You know, at the time I started to get, uh, I started to become, you know, bitter and jaded um, about the business that I that I loved and the business that I that I had become very successful in. I, I started to, which, which I think is very common um, uh, for people in, in, in this business, right? You, you, know, you attain a certain amount of success, or even if you don't attain a certain amount of success, it's easy to become, um, to become bitter and jaded and, you know, that's ah, all a bunch of crap. I mean, I think if you asked a, a teenager what they hope to achieve in life, they might say fame and fortune. Well, by the time you were 31 or 32, you'd had fame for sure and mm -hmm. presumably fortune. But you talk about resetting your goals. So so what were the goals at 32 or 33? I uh, made it my new goal that I wanted to do a show, an, an adult show and an adult that would be critically uh, acclaimed, hopefully in North America, but really hopefully around the world. Like mm -hmm. that was... That was what I wanted. That's, well, that's a pretty that, lofty goal. Well, 100%. <laughs> I didn't, you know, it took me a couple of uh, swings at it, right? Um, but eventually I landed with Call Me Fitz. I landed on that show. I am your conscience. I am the good part of you, and I will make you whole again. You think you're my conscience? And Fitz was a big departure for me, Jason Priestley. That character was a big departure from the kind of characters that I think um, my uh, core audience had ever seen me play before. And that whole experience for me was, um, was, a, was a real turning point, I think, in my career. Mm. Well, let's talk about uh, a project of yours that you directed, you narrated as well. Uh, it's, a, it's a documentary about the former Toronto Maple Police owner, Harold Ballard. Who told you that I interfered with the team? Never interfered with the team in my life. Now there's all sorts of debris being thrown onto the ice. I have to sit through an entire winter of this garbage with the Maple Leafs. Not to be impolite, but why? Why Why do a documentary on him? He is the type of character that was so ripe for this type of deep dive mm -hmm. documentary and a real examination of, of, of a fascinating Canadian character who's very un-Canadian. Certain players loved him because there was no consensus. And, and, and so many different opinions uh, between all these people who knew him and either loved him or hated him. I felt it was important to merely lay out all of the information that we received from all these people and, and in, a, in a very entertaining and palatable way and let the, let the audience who watches the documentary make their own decision about Harold Ballard. So you got a chance to look back at the history of hockey and, and the history of, of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and maybe I'll end with, with this exercise in looking back. The, Jason Priestley today, if you could talk to the younger Jason, what would you say to him? I would tell that one to relax and just enjoy the ride he was about to go on. I was wound way too tight at the beginning of that show because I, I was... You know, I was I was twenty. It was twenty one when we started. I was twenty when we did the pilot. I was twenty one when we when we started that show, and I'd never been number one on a call sheet before. And I knew what an awesome responsibility that was, and I and I carried the weight of that show really heavy. I mean, it's you know, I think it's good that I took it seriously, mm -hmm. but I, but it, it took away from a, a lot of. I didn't enjoy myself the way that I. I mean, I should have enjoyed myself more than I did. Well, if he sees you now, you look like a guy who's has no weight on your shoulders and seems pretty, <laughs> pretty comfortable where you are. Yeah, well, I, you know, that's, uh, I, I am now. I've learned how to relax uh, a little more now. I mean, I, I, feel like, I feel like, you know, with age uh, and experience comes a lot more confidence uh, as well. Oh, you've earned it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Really nice talking to you. Thanks, Ian. You too, man.